Probation Talk 101, uh, the truth about LA County Probation. And it's something that we wanna do on a regular basis when it comes up to you know, issues of concern. Uh, we had a committee formed on this and uh, one of the priorities uh, that was determined at that time was that we do something on school base, given that uh, you know, there's some lobbying to take the funding away, et cetera. So we wanna be able to, um, to have this meeting, to have an open dialogue about what we do in probation, to be able to share uh, some of the insights, not only from people that, you know, that are probation officers, but also we're, we're very happy to have Rich here as well uh, from Walnut, uh, 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 is it, in, in, what's the, uh, it's not a high school, was it? Sorry, Rich. It's middle school. Middle school, okay, Walnut Middle School. Uh, I see we have uh, Felicia Cotton, who's a deputy director, myself, uh, we have Cookie Lamel, uh, Eric Walton, who's a DSO. We have Tiffany Escada, also uh, Dwight uh, Thompson, uh, and we have Martha Aguirre, who's a former uh, PO in that um, program. So uh, basically, uh, when we start, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start recording. Oh, it's already recording. Well, okay, it's recording now. That's fine. We this is a room of friendly people. Uh, we don't have any child advocates telling us that we're the worst people in the world and that you know nothing that we does work do works. So um, as we uh, progress, uh, I have some questions that we want to talk about, but I see the framework first as, uh, you know, doing the introductions and then um, kind of giving an introduction on what we're going to be talking about tonight. And then I wanted to start off with Felicia and have her kind of give um, an introduction of what is school-based, nothing that's too uh, um, technical, uh, but in a way uh, that uh, a lay person can understand what the program is and how what it was designed to do, et cetera, et cetera. And then after um, she gives the introduction, uh, you know, about what that is, then uh, I will um, have some questions and I'll, you know, we'll, we'll go around. And then uh, what I would ask is that when you're not talking to have the, uh, uh, your, your microphone muted uh, so we don't get any interference. And uh, this is the first time we're doing this. Uh, we're on a tight schedule, we wanna finish it tonight, edit it and get it out before the 14th. As you know, uh, the JJCC meets on the 14th uh, to discuss the possible defunding or more defunding of um, school-based program. So um, do you guys have any questions on this? Again, we're not, uh, no pressure. It's not, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, uh, but we do wanna get everyone start the dialogue going. And, uh, and then, uh, you know how it works, you know, if you're talking, if you wanna, if you wanna say something, instead of using the raise hand feature, which kind of gets a little cumbersome at times, you can just either raise your hand or, you know, when, when someone finishes speaking, you can just, you know, interject and, and say or contribute something uh, at that point. So uh, are we good? Yeah, everyone? Martha, yes. Dwight, ready to go? It yes. smells good. It smells good, Martha. <laughs> ready to go, thank you. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Hans Leong, and I serve as the president of Ask Me Local 685, the LA County Deputy Probation Officers Union. Today, we are launching a new uh, platform uh, called Probation Talk 101, the truth about probation. Uh, and we uh, uh, are, are, are providing this forum where we can have transparent uh, conversations about the probation department, about the operations, et cetera, uh, and as a way uh, to get an accurate depiction of what it is we do. Uh, and then once we're done with this, um, we're going to, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna see if I can, how the time is to see whether we can edit it down and, and create a, 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 a more bite-sized uh, clips for it as well. So uh, today we're very fortunate to have a, a panel, a very experienced panel uh, on the subject of school base. We have uh, Felicia Cotton, who is a deputy director uh, for the probation department. Felicia, you wanna give everyone a little wave? Thank you. We also have Rich Nambu, who is a principal at Walnut uh, uh, Middle School. Uh, we have Cookie Lamel, who works for uh, Probation Hey Rich. And uh, we have Eric Walton, who serves as a DSO in uh, Silmar. We have Tiffany Escada. And Tiffany, are you still uh, working with school-based or what, what are you no, I No, I actually am the staff assistant in the child trafficking unit right now. Okay. So I many, left, um, go ahead. No, okay. So you left school-based when? Uh, five years ago. Okay. But I did school base for 12 years. Okay. Now we have uh, Stacy there as well. He is our camp's vice president. Uh, we have Jonathan Bird, who is the uh, chief steward. We have Dwight Thompson, who's our field VP, and uh, Martha Geary, 
uh, who was a former deputy in the um, in the uh, school-based program. So uh, as a way to begin, uh, you know, we're talking about the school-based program, and I think it would be best at this time that we have our deputy director, Felicia Cotton, who was very involved uh, in the development of this program in the early days, if she could give us kind of uh, uh, a layman's view of what school-based is and, and, and what the program is and what it was designed to do and uh, what are the outcomes that it was, it was trying to achieve. So Felicia, can you uh, take the floor right now and kind of give us a summary on that? Be delighted to. Um, good evening, everyone. The school-based program was a great opportunity for the probation department to move away from an office-based type supervision in juvenile and to really deliver services in the community in which kids are embedded. So what we did was um, JJCPA, which is Juvenile Justice Crime Prevention Act, provided funding uh, for us around $31 million to really begin to look at ways to really put treatment and intervention programs in the community. So this placed over 100 and I believe 40, about 140, I might not have my number exact, I might be 142, 143, but somewhere over 140 deputies on various school campuses throughout um, Los Angeles County. And the, the main role that we wanted there, most of the kids that come to us have been the victim of various school failures um, um, and, and lack school attachment, didn't believe they could achieve. And so the, the, the real reason that we wanted to place our school-based probation officers there was for educational advocacy to really begin to be that bridge between family and school, to be on site, to really support our educational, uh, our folks that were delivering educational services to our kids. Because number one, um, we wanted to reduce the amount of time that school officials spent around uh, trying to get our kids there, trying to get our kids engaged. So we really wanted to become a part of education, not the uh, law enforcement arm, but the part of education that we know help young people um, to make better decisions and become better people. So that's it in a nutshell. There are some other pieces that I'm certain we can get into. The program was aimed to reduce uh, recidivism, to promote school success, to promote educational aspiration, to promote interactions with teachers, to promote uh, increasing commitment to school, um, certainly we wanted to see them be in compliance and certainly if they did all that, they would be in compliance with the orders of the court. Uh, and we really wanted to strengthen parent practices because we found that parents were not as engaged um, with uh, school officials as they needed to be. And, and oftentimes would take a, 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 a adversarial role um, with school officials. So we wanted to be that conduit, that, that uh, piece that really connected uh, kids and families um, to school. We believe that that is one of the most powerful pro-social uh, interventions that you can provide a young person. And that is for them to get their education and to be able to make great decisions as they grow and um, become adults. So Felicia, do you, uh, can you give us a little insight on in when this program uh, was in, incepted or when it was uh, started? So some of you will remember that this program probably got its, its first um, steps in the department back in the 80s where, and, and, and we um, started what we call the Gang Alternative and Prevention Program, and it was called GAP. So that's where we first got the framework. Um, and during that time, we didn't do a great job of collecting data, but we had cities that said, hey, I had a probation officer over here that did these things for us. And they started to tell us all these things, that, all these unanticipated benefits that we hadn't even had on the table. You know, they engaged families. They did all these things. They bought programs. Um, to our community. Some of them taught Bible study after hours. We heard all these great things that probation officers brought on board. So as we um, began to suffer some budget cuts, some of those cities contracted DPOs. So then it moved into a contracted type school-based probation officer, for which I was one, uh, contracted in the city of Torrance um, and um, parts of the city of Lawndale, working with kids that had been expelled. And then in 2000, we received uh, $31 million through the Juvenile Justice Crime Prevention Act, which allowed us now to begin to take everything that we learned and to really cobble them together, find schools where we had larger numbers of probation, high crime neighborhoods, poverty, DCFS, everything that was um, deemed to be uh, a negative or risk factor for kids, and we embedded ourselves in those communities on those school campuses. And then Felicia, during the time uh, that, you know, since the inception of school-based program, do you know, 
just a rough idea of how many uh, kids uh, were serviced through the program? I can tell you from 2016, and, and I'll try to get you some, some more numbers because when you look back again, it was uh, kids might have been um, uh, serviced through housing or school. So I know we did one year 16,000 kids um, in the beginning. Um, that's when we had high, high um, that's when we had at risk as well as youth on probation. And we have probation officers at parks that would feed kids to school base. Um, as of 2016, we had 4,500. 2017, we went to 4,000. 2018 is the year that we uh, somewhat started to this campaign to get rid of the 236 um, type uh, supervision at risk youth. And we plummeted to 1,500 there. And now we're looking at somewhere around 629 youth. Okay, so, so starting at about 16,000 and now down to about 600. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Felicia. You know, we can, get, we can uh, follow up with you on, on further questions. I want to uh, give uh, a chance for Rich to speak. Um, you know, being a principal of a school and given that you have this new program coming in, uh, if you could share with us um, how that, that kind of uh, initiation began and how uh, the program uh, worked in your school. Like, how did that, you know, how did, how did you guys work that out when it began? So I'm probably familiar with the program for probably about 15 years uh, when I was an assistant principal at Edgewood Middle School and now that I'm principal at uh, Walnut Grove, uh, Tiffany was was our original uh, uh, PO there. We had Sam Jones and, and Stan Lamb and uh, uh, in all our years with, with all of those people, it, it, it was just the most successful program at supporting our most at-risk kids. Those kids who were the most defiant and the most disruptive and dealing with things that the classroom teacher could not deal with, that these are the kids who would get sent out and they would get suspended or some of them would be expelled and things like that, that, that the, the POs were the, the, the only people in my almost 40 years, 38 years, I worked in LAUSD for 20 some odd years in the district office and as a teacher and coach and things, uh, that that really supported those kids who who just so struggled at school, whether it was socially or academically, and and POs had both the the experience and the knowledge and and the ability to talk to the kids on their level. That that it wasn't just a counselor trying to just listen to them and ask them you know about their feelings or something, but but someone who could be really straight with kids. And these kids really needed. To, to be talked to straight and their families too. And, and one of the keys to the program is that there was a caring adult for these kids at school every day. Who knew, right? You know, it could be on a Tuesday or a Friday or every day, right? That, that these kids would struggle and so that they would touch base, whether it be uh, at any, whatever time of, of the day or whatever period, every day they would get checked in with. And that's what what really made the program work. So these kids felt like they had an advocate at school and that they had someone who would listen to them, you know, oh, you know, my dad uh, cracked my, my mom with a, you know, a, a Coke bottle and she was bleeding this morning, right? And they go to school and, and, you know, are just angry and then they get kicked out of class and they're not gonna tell me who's gonna suspend them if they do that, right? And so it, it, it provided, my whatever it was 50 kids at the first and maybe you know 30 kids by the end uh, a vehicle to to be listened to to be talked to it gave them it, it brought right counseling support support for their families they went on field trips and things like that so so it it really ended up saving a lot of kids who, who would have left the system right uh, uh, you know whatever. I was in LAUSD where right 30 or 50 percent of ninth graders never graduate, right? And, and so these are the kids who in 10th grade would always leave. And, and they were able, and I was in a middle school, I, I was in high school in LA, but I was always in a middle school when uh, I was with the POs. And it's, it's building a future for the kids. Tiffany did that, Sam did that, Martha would take our kids. So, so Martha, we would feed our kids into Martha. And, and so uh, it was just, uh, the most effective program for the hardest to deal with kids. And, and everyone has them at every school and you remember them back when you were in school. They were the kids you were afraid of, right? 
they were the kids who were dealing things and everyone would always point at them and things like that and go, wow, why are these kids in school? But, but they're in school to get an education, but they just need a lot more supports than your normal kid. So what type of uh, working relationship did you have with the uh, probation officers? Now we would talk most, most every day. I have a really small school and, and the, the office Tiffany had was like, you know, 10 steps from my office and things like that. And, you know, she'd be out at nutrition and lunch and we would be out at nutrition and lunch. We'd be talking to the kids and, and, you know, we would talk daily. Oh my goodness. Did you hear what that kid said to Miss Gomez? Oh my God, she is going to fire on that. Right. And how are we going to get this kid back in the class and things like that? And, and so, uh, we, we were always trying to talk and, and how we're going to help these kids. And, well, he's not going to be able to go back to class for a little while. So, Tiffany, you're going to have to keep it over this, right? And, and, and they were always awesome with that. And, and so our teachers loved the program. I mean, I, I must have brought, you know, half my staff when you guys were, were you know, getting defunded. And we came to one of the meetings with kids and, and did things and stuff. And so... Uh, we are still an advocate and my staff still bring up every year. Hey, when can we get, you know, someone back here to really, you know, support them? Now, let me ask you this, you know, um, oftentimes you hear the voices out there that would say that probation officers in the school are nothing but uh, thuggish cops that are looking to violate kids and lock them up and that they're looking for every opportunity for these kids to fail and uh, to get them locked up and basically the whole a pipeline to prison kind of uh, uh, um, objectives that probation had. I don't know if uh, Tiffany or any of the other people that worked in that program want to comment on that about uh, how you interacted with the youth and whether or not you know you use your adversary you were adversarial or if you were using motivational interviewing or you know like de-escalation techniques. Uh, Tiffany. I think um, the most important thing is to really listen to these kids. You know, these kids are at school. A lot of times the teachers had no idea what was going on in their lives or what they were dealing with. You know, they have a job on their own end to do, you know, in terms of making sure they, you know, the kids are testing where they need to test and so forth. So they're not necessarily paying attention to Johnny in the corner of the classroom who's thinking about hurting himself or, you know, something happened at home like Mr. Nambu was mentioning. Those are those things that we see or that we've been trained to see as POs like, that kid's not focused on algebra right now. He's focused on something completely different or seeing a kid and saying, hey, how did you get that, you know, uh, black eye? You know, there's a lot of times, sometimes uh, teachers don't necessarily see that kind of stuff. You know, they're focused on certain things. And so we, we taking them out by themselves or talking to them, you know, separate from the classroom, it was such so important because we saw them every day. It wasn't like we saw them once a month, like we normally see our clients and stuff in the office. We see them every day. We see them in the morning when they check in, you know, the beginning of the day to make sure they're at school. You know, those things are so important. Yes, motivational interviewing, all the techniques we've learned along the way are so critical to working with these kids. You know, I have to say, you know, in my years that I worked school-based, it was probably one of the best positions I ever had in this job. I still talk to some of the kids to this day that are now grown adults because they cared and they, they really benefited from the services that we provided as POs in the schools. Yeah, I think that they care because they know that you guys care. I think that's a big, big thing there. You know, let me ask you, um, Tiffany, mm -hmm. how would you characterize the relationship or the interactions with the kids? Would you say it's primarily adversarial where you were being authoritarian or was, it more, was it more collaborative and trying to work together? Absolutely collaborative. You know, I worked at two middle schools and I had great uh, relationships with all the administrators I worked with. I thought it was important for them to see. I, Mr. Nambu and I know that you know, we would talk about different things because I, I would advocate for my kids a lot of times and say, hey, give this kid a chance, especially that kid who's trying to play a sport or whatnot, but doesn't have the grades. I say, let me get let me have some time with this kid. Let me help him, you know, with his academics or whatever to bring up his grades so he can play sports because that's all he has, you mm -hmm. know. So I, I remember a couple conversations I had with Mr. Nambu, like, hey, let me give this kid a shot. You know, let him put him in sports, get him active, get him involved, make him feel like he's a part of something, you know, so he can, you know, so he can do better. So he can, so he can thrive with his academics because he wants to play football. So never did I think it was an adversary thing. I always felt compelled to be like almost essentially like an, another mom to them, like another support to them, you know, that they may or may not have at home. 
So let me ask you this, and uh, any one of the panelists uh, that have worked in that operation, and Rich, uh, Felicia, you can contribute if you, as you see fit. But um, you know, there are those out there that are talking about pipeline to prison and all that kind of stuff, and that uh, all these kids are being rounded up by probation and put under probation supervision, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it's my understanding, uh, or, or let me let me sorry, um, in regards to that, how many, if you can just rough estimate of those people that you worked with ended up going into a more severe uh, um, condition? Like, was there a pipeline to prison? Did you, could you see that or not? So we did two look backs. We did one that looked back five years early on, and we were in around the 92 to 94% of youth that did not return to the system. So now let me ask you. That did, um, um, but we were 92. Then we looked at it again some years out, probably about six years ago, and it was at about 86. So we've been okay. between 86 and 90, 94% youth okay. that do not return. Okay, now, now let me ask uh, the panel as well. Um, do you think that if the school-based program was not in effect, that those 90% would have ended up uh, you know, being okay at the end, or do you think that the program really contributed it to their success? I don't know. If, I think uh, the program. I think the program. I think the program really contributed to the success of a lot of these kids. I mean, okay. the fact that they saw. Go ahead. No, I'm another, saying yeah. The, another statistic that's really important, and I know in probation we always, you know, recidivism or entering into the criminal justice system or continuing to to get arrested is an important statistic for us in probation, but. Being in school base, I think an even more important statistic would have been how many of the kids that we worked graduated. with graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. That is huge. So what, huge what percentage would you what percentage would you say graduated, Martha? That were of, in the program? The kids that we worked with that mm -hmm. continue to stay in our that were in our program through their senior year. I mean, I, I I would have to say it is very high, probably it has to be in the 80 or 90 percent. Okay, and you don't think that, that we worked with because those kids, even mm -hmm. um, when you have children that you've had on your caseload and you've worked with them and then they may term may or may not terminate uh, while they're uh, still in high school, you're still there with them on that school campus. You're still uh, connected to them in the sense that um, you're supporting them all the way through graduation, even though they may not technically be on your caseload anymore. You're still on that school campus. And so mm -hmm. to me, that is such a huge, huge factor that if school base goes away, that is going to be the the biggest disservice to these children, um, not only whether or not they go into the criminal justice system, there's going to be so many kids you're not even going to know about because they would have dropped out. We deal and think, with. And, and I think the, the thing I want to say with that, Martha, is even with Martha working at the high school, she was one of my feeder schools. Her and I would communicate constantly. I think it's important that when you had an eighth grader about to go into high school that was still teetering and not sure like you know where they were going it was great that her and I would communicate in the summertime and say okay let's get this kid on the right track when they start high school so they had a connection when they started high school as well so Hans I'm I'm, I'm loving this conversation because that was the what the 31 million pay for a summer strategy which these kids would not have had meaning that in the summertime you had the in middle school PO preparing the kids for handoff to the high school mm -hmm. PO who was mm -hmm. welcoming, them, welcoming them in. In South LA, they had a rate of these kids not showing up at a 50% rate at a few of the schools like Markham Middle School and different places where we were, where they kid, the kids just didn't show up. They didn't make that transition into the high school. And back to Martha, she's absolutely right. Um, in 2016-17, we had 81% of the youth that graduated were eligible to graduate. 17-18, we had 89%. 18, 19, 82 percent, and 1920, we were at 89 percent of the eligible youth graduated in the school-based program. So they're absolutely um, correct, and it's really good to hear how these things played out and that this, this summer strategy, we really had to do a lot of convincing of folks that we need to do this work in the summer to get kids ready and excited about going into high school, um, which otherwise would not have been available to them had, had these officers not been spending their summers. A lot of people ask, what do they do in the summer when the kids are out? 
well, this is what they do in the summer. We find kids, we get them ready to go to school. We get them in some employment program so that they have funds to um, be able to now purchase clothes. Ago. I mean, we've done all sorts mm -hmm. of things that these mm -hmm. officers have become creative and mm -hmm. getting these kids ready to go to school. Haircuts at the park um, where we had folks to donate and come just do back to school haircuts so kids could look good when they went back to school. This is all the work of the of the probation school base. And many, much of it is the brain, their brainchild, what they came together and said, this is what these families need. Uh, can you make it happen? So my job is to make it happen as they bring it to me. Um, and, and, and it's been well worth it. Thanks, Felicia. Let me, let me uh, just uh, pivot a little bit or, or talk a little bit more about uh, how the school-based supervision works. You know, uh, there's these voices out there that say that uh, probation officers on campus are basically uh, fishing and looking for kids. And once they see kids get out of line, they take them and put them under uh, this 236 supervision to keep them in line. Is that how it works? I don't know if Felicia or Rich, you want to talk about that process? Because it's uh, it's my understanding uh, that a lot of the parents had sought help uh, and that that initiated a lot of that. Does anyone want to talk on that, on how someone would get into the school-based program or be part of that? Yeah, so it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of all those things, right? It's, it's families that, that reach out to you knowing that, that they can't, right, deal with, with you know, their, their son or daughter very well. It's, it's teachers kind of telling you, hey, this student is, is really struggling uh, uh, social, emotionally, you know, and academically. It's, it's, it's just walking the campus and, and anyone that walks campus, you can see those kids who, who right, are, are, are really struggling, you know, uh, uh, connecting with other people in a positive way and so on and so forth. And, and uh, so, yeah, we could look a lot at, at data, right? So you'd look at academic data, you'd look at discipline data and things like that. And uh, so, you know, we would, we would identify kids and, and, and then one of the key components is, is that, you know, Martha and, and Tiffany and, and, you know, whoever was in that seat is going to connect with the family because it's the, it's, it's the families who are the ones who are really struggling, right? These kids are, don't just grow up at, out of nowhere. And, and so it's, it's them giving those families uh, uh, resources and, and, and uh, abilities to, to deal with it. You know, oh, I don't know what to do with this student, right? He just goes home and he, he runs away and he does this. Well, you know, Tiffany and them can, well, you know, this is what, have you tried this? Did you do this, right? And so on and so forth. And, and that's what would make the, the, the biggest impact over the long run because you know all of us whether it was Tiffany or Martha right eventually those kids aren't with us but but the parents are always with them and, and so it, it's those sorts of wraparound things that that we're helping the student we're helping the teachers be able to deal with them well and they were helping me be able to deal with them but they're helping their parents right and their and their you know brothers and sisters right they were family things that Tiffany would have the whole family in and be talking to them because that's what needs to happen right to really change a system where you know by the time the kids in eighth grade you know you can usually identify those kids way early right who are really struggling but you know the program doesn't start till middle school and and so it it it's it's looking at, at students who who it's it's pretty easy to see you know oh this kid needs more support and then it's is is the you know po program going to be the best place or is it just counseling or is it just this and so on and so forth and so uh, so, so it sounds like uh, the parents were receptive or they participated in that i mean how did they take the program were they resistant or they they were welcoming it yeah if they were resistant they were in the program because if they didn't buy in it wasn't going to happen okay so the and, and just to be clear i think a lot of times when they say 236 or school-based program that these kids are getting put on formal probation, but uh, I don't know if Felicia wants to explain it or the technicality of it in that it's sort of a contract. Uh, it's not, you know, the parents are involved in that as well. It's not uh, us filing on kids and getting them put on formal probation, is it? No, it's not. Um, actually 236 of the Welfare and Institutions Code says that probation departments may engage in activities designed to prevent delinquency. So this is one of the ways back, way back when we were filing 601 petitions, which were giving kids records um, to deal with them. Um, some of them would come to us through the SARB, that's the school attendance review board. Some of them, some of them would come to us because parents came to the office asking for help. This was a new mechanism put in place 
that only pro that provided kids services. They got nothing entered into a system, um, nothing entered into our JJ in, into our um, our uh, uh, probation case management system known as PCMS. We even had a small system built on top of PCMS where we would remove the name of the kids and give them numbers only to do recidivism studies. So the youth, um, if the youth got arrested tomorrow, that information that Martha or Tiffany had could not be used in a pre-plea or in a, any kind of probation report to say that they had already gotten services. So it's not even informal probation, it's not putting kids on probation, it's delivering probation services to those um, that need the services. And yes, it, did, it requires that parents sign off on an agreement saying that they are in agreement. So we don't just fish and look for, um, walk around looking for kids. Um, we, can, we can see kids on campus and believe that we need to get involved, but yet a parent has to agree that yes, there, there are some issues here and, and, we, and we want it. Um, just like um, um, Mr. Nambu indicated, um, it doesn't work without the parents um, kind of being involved with us. We become their eyes, their ears, and we just help them through really a rough period, empower them to take over and be the case managers that, that, that they can be for their kids. So it sounds like uh, the 236 program is more of a collaborative program with the school, the family, the youth, and uh, with the probation department as a collaborative team. And, and our community partners, because oftentimes we would bring community-based resources onto the campus so that youth would not be suspended or expelled. They could be um, have an intervention on campus, which would leave them on campus and in-school suspension uh, and different types of interventions that might um, be afforded to the youth um, through various community-based organizations that we contract with. Thanks, Felicia. I, you know, I have another question. It's, uh, as we all know, uh, we have voices out there that are saying other things. And I'm asking the panel, like, why do you think uh, they're uh, characterizing probation in such a way? Why are they, um, you know, it's, it's quite clear, you know, for us that do the job, what it's about. It's clear with the principal, you know, Rich uh, articulating the collaborations. So why do you think uh, these voices are out there? Do you think perhaps they're having some experiences uh, in other schools that are negative? Tiffany, did you want to answer that? I saw you put your hand up. Um, I just think they don't know what we do. I think we, we have not showcased all the great work that our school-based deputies have done throughout all these years. I know POs, including Martha and so many others, when we used to collaborate at our big once a year event, I remember hearing like POs using their own money to take kids like on, on trips in the summer to the beach. I know Martha is taking the kids hiking. You know, we've done so many things that's never been showcased. I used to do a program called Shop with the Cop at Christmas time where we take kids uh, you know, shopping at Christmas time. Never has that ever been showcased to all the great things that we've done in this department with these kids. There are so many great POs out there that work in the schools. There really is, and they do so many great things and nobody knows about them. Yeah, you know, it's a kind of a shame. It's, uh, it's one thing uh, where we're focusing our energy on the youth and really trying to be innovative and, and, and do what we do as probation officers to help these kids and also now uh, to have to figure out uh, uh, some kind of strategies or whatever to to articulate and get our message out there, you know, um, it becomes an extra burden for us, you know, and it's something that we're doing now. Uh, but I know, I mean, even as Felicia had indicated, when I was working uh, in the gang unit, uh, I had collaborated with one of the community partners, which was a community-based agency in the, in the community, and I had discussions with Stan Lamb. At that time, he was at Alhambra High. So we had a great network going of communication, not only from the schools to the parents, but from the schools to the CBOs and the POs that were assigned to the CBOs. And we did some great things. You know, Tiffany, you mentioned some of those things you did. When I was uh, at the uh, community-based agency, you know, we did, uh, you know, I, I have a little music studio at home. So we were recording music, we were doing um, rap music, you know, those kids, those young kids all wanted to be rappers, right? So. So we recorded songs and things like that, and we used that as a basis, you know, when they wrote lyrics to write about who they were and about how they see themselves in the future, et cetera. So, you know, now that we're talking about this, I don't know if uh, uh, any of you, you know, we have the general generic uh, definition of what our duties are. We monitor kids, we work this, whatever, whatever. But obviously in our discussion right now, it sounds to me that 
uh, uh, there are a lot of the deputies that go above and beyond what's required. So maybe at this time, if anybody wants to share uh, some experience or something that you did uh, or something that you heard about that school-based deputies that were doing that went above and beyond what just the job title um, description was. Anyone? You know, like I was talking to Ernesto Sandoval and he had made a comment, you know, like uh, on times when he was working, if some kids weren't at school and the parents would call, that he would actually go there and pick them up and, br and bring them to school, right? He would actually go there, knock on the door, say, hey, uh, get in the shower, we, we're going to school, you know, or get dressed, we're going to school. Like that's not, you know, that's not something that's necessarily part of our duties, right? You know, doing the music, that's not necessarily part of our duties. But are there any other things that you can think of that are unique and special that, that probation officers uh, did uh, in the school-based program? Tiffany, I see you unmuted yourself. Well, hey. uh, oh, well no. I just, I can, say, I can say that when I was at uh, Walnut Grove, I brought the Pomona Court Juvenile Court judges to that, to not only Walnut Grove, but to the middle school that I worked at in West Covina and did a, a intervention program there where we, they would come once a month and meet with a group of girls. We've taken them to lunch, you know, just different activities where they could talk to them about different topics. Back then it was a big like social media thing going on. So they would talk to them about different things that were going on with that, different topics every week or whatnot. And it was, it was so good. And then I did an at-risk homeroom at my other school where we'd meet every day. So homeroom class, I would be in there with a teacher and meet every day with these girls. And, and we would talk about different topics, you know, life goals, you know, like life skills and, you know, how to write a check and how to do different things just so they can learn stuff that they weren't taught by their parents and or just to mentor them. And this is something you did on your own, Tiffany, that wasn't some mandate. To... Nope, not at okay, all. So, so that was, your own, that was your own innovation there on, on that then. I loved it. One of the, one of the teachers <clears throat> talked to me about it one year and said, Hey, would you be interested in, you know, uh, being in this homeroom class with us? They picked, they picked a, uh, a bunch of girls that they thought would benefit from it. And we met with them. Like I said, every single day, it was like a class, you know, even when the teacher wasn't there, there was days that I was in there rapping with the kids, you know, on my own, yes. you know, so go ahead. Did, did you have something, Dwight? Did you want to say something? I, I was going to add, um, you know, yeah, you ahead. have, you only have a, a couple uh, school-based officers represented oh. here and, and actually we're, we're not even in the program anymore, but we were in it for, for a very long time. And I, I don't even think you have enough time this evening to go over a list like that because I, I you know, just having talked, been in school base for 20 years and having met so many amazing officers who gave their their blood, sweat and tears, money out of their pockets. And and I could tell you, you know, the things that, you know, I did it at my school. I mean, school base was I never thought I would leave. I, I honestly thought I would retire from that position. But because of fear of of what's happening right now, um, you know, I, I wanted to um, leave before I was forced to go somewhere that maybe I didn't have a choice in. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there. I think school-based, and in, in, I don't mean to just toot our horn, but <laughs> you have some of the most amazing, amazing people in this department that have either gone through school-based, been in, or, or currently are. Some of the most passionate people that really, really care about kids and have done, you know, all kinds of things that a lot of times we spent out of our own pockets to make happen. Um, and... Um, it's really, really disheartening when to hear that we've been villainized in a way in this whole probation to prison pipeline. Um, when I hear that, I, I, I just, I don't even, my jaw just drops because it's, yeah. there's, it's so far from the truth. It's nowhere near. And it's almost like, it's just like this ridiculous thing. And, and, and how do you respond to something that's, that's so ridiculous? Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's very hard, especially for those of us, you know, who dedicate our time, our life, like you said, blood, sweat and tears. And when we're always thinking about new ways to help these kids and then to have someone, you know, that doesn't know what we do come around and just, you know, throw mud at us and, and demonize us as a way that they have. So it's understanding how, you know, disheartening that can be, Martha. 
Yeah, and, and and you asked why do you think these things are being said? And if I'm being quite honest, I mean we're all we're all. Uh, you said this is a friendly meeting. I mean it, it's about money because well, there's agencies that want the you know the bigger piece of the pie, and instead of understanding that we all need to work together as a team to provide the services that need to be provided in the community, we you have CBOs that think that they can do our job, and the reality is that they. We all need each other. We need them to provide the services that they provide and their expertise of whatever their counseling agency provides, but they need us to be able to bring those kids to them, to be to able be. to engage those kids, to be able to get them to buy into it. Um, we're the key to that. And they don't understand that. We were also the key, and I know Mr. Nambu can, can attest to this. We were the key that gave them access to the kids in the school because the schools are not going to be so readily open to just allow all these random CBOs to come on their campus and work with their students. But because probation was there and probation could attest to what these agencies were providing, then the schools were comfortable in allowing them into their campuses to be able to provide those services after school. And who made that happen? Well, that was the PO. That was a school-based PO that created that credibility for the school to be able to trust probation to say, okay, if probation is vouching for such and such CVO, then we are comfortable with them. Without probation, that, that, that kind of collaboration is very hard to come by. And I know Mr. Nambu can tell you, schools don't allow people on their campuses just like willy-nilly. You know, if there's a, a lot of process they have to go through, especially in this day and age with background checks and making sure they're safe around children. So removing us from that, taking us off the table to work with kids in a school setting and in the communities is, is, is really, really sad. It, it is, it's gonna be a huge loss to these communities. It's already happening because school base has, you know, has changed so much and so many schools have lost their officers. But if the, if the program goes away completely, it is a huge, huge loss to, to our communities. Yeah, while, while money is always a concern and we understand that, I think that uh, for all of us, we understand that regardless of the money, uh, whatever is the best approach for the youth in the community is what we should be focusing on. So uh, I see Stacy, our, our camp's vice president has their, his hand up. Did you wanna comment, Stacy? You know, one year I was distributing some documents and I went over, I believe it was RX Paris over in Palmdale. And I was delivering some union documents to one of our uh, POs there. And when I arrived, there were about four students in line to speak with her. Uh, Melinda Thomas, that's her name. And so I sat in the corner. You know, I didn't want to interrupt because I really didn't know what was going on. So I sat in the corner quietly. And for an hour, I watched her interact with all these different kids. And I was so impressed with what I saw, the relationship that she had with those young people, it was just awesome. And then when she was done, I asked her, I said, well, what was that all about? She said, oh, honey, this is every day. The kids always wanna come in and, and they wanna talk to me and they're comfortable. And then the principal came in and one of the teachers came in and, and, they, and they were talking about another kid that they wanted her to talk to. And I thought, man, I wanna do this. This is, this is cool, you know? She says, well, Ford, you know, you gotta be a DPO too to do this. I'm like, well, dang. But just to see her interaction with those kids, it just, man, it made me feel so good. I think the problem that we, we're having in probation is that people don't know what we do. They have no, idea the love and the concern that we have for for these young people so you know to 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 lose this program or, or, or this program go to someone else i think it, it would just be horrible and i think we can work together with the community i think we both have something to offer on both sides of the table to make this thing work so uh brother hans i just want to thank you for this this, this, this conversation and I think it needs to be a part two where you can get some other uh, uh, school-based folks that are currently working school-based and have them come on the show and, and just have them talk about what they're doing right now. I think that would be a good idea. 
Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. So, so Mr. Lang, I don't, and right in what Stacy was saying and Martha was saying, to, to all those people who are really, you know, so against it, if, if you were able to write and talk to them, if they were able to go to a site and just spend a day, spend a half a day with, with at least any of the POs that I ever experienced, right? And, and they would see that, that it's not this adversarial thing, that the, the people there, they love each other. The, the kids love the, the, the PO that's there because they built a better relationship with them than any teacher, than any person, because they just meet with them every day. And, and so it, you would be hard pressed to, to have people who experience the program think of it the way you're talking about it. But when you just look at data, right, and you just see it from, from afar, in theory, it's easy to say those things, right? You read the newspaper, you read those things. But if people experienced it, it would be very different. Yeah, I think that's that's a very good point. Uh, a lot of times people are making uh, judgments not, not based on true experience, but, you know, like you said, based on, you know, news article headlines. Uh, Eric, uh, our institutions, VP, I see you have your hand up. Did you want to comment? Yes, um, I wanted to say this because um, for a number of years I've worked uh, in uh, with our high risk offenders unit. And for the past six years, I've been the uh, movement coordinator. So a lot of the cases and a lot of the young people that come into the facility, I see a lot of their cases. A lot of the school based officers had a full grasp of the young people that were part of their caseload and the ones that they were pretty much uh, check on daily because a lot of the school based deputies would not have to bring any of their kids into the facility and there was no violation. Um, and I would see case after case that would come into the halls and most of them were either CDP violations or violations that were committed on the street uh, where another law enforcement agency would bring them into the facility. And the effectiveness of what school base has done will cut down on any of the recidivism rate and a lot of the young people that were brought into the institution that were detained for uh, whatever various violations or whether or not if the court uh, decided to uh, keep the youth in the facility till the time their case would go through the court process. So uh, from my perspective of what I've been able to see on my end on the various uh, cases that came through my desk, um, School base were, has been one of those parts of the department that has been effective in doing what they do. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you know, we're coming up on about an hour right now. I think that uh, in our discussions, uh, it's kind of clear about what the benefits are. I think also uh, we're, we're understanding also the losses that would occur uh, if the school-based program were to go away. So at this time, um, you know, before we conclude, uh, we have, uh, you know, I want to open it up for anyone to make any final comments or any statements that they want to make. Uh, and then, uh, and then I think we, we have a good, uh, um, a body of video right now. And I think that, you know, hopefully like what, uh, Stacy was saying is that through this type of medium that we're using, that we can get this discussion out to other people that don't know what we do, don't know about the school-based program and uh, get them to understand us a little more. So uh, does anyone want to add uh, any final comments regarding the discussion today about school base, uh, anything they want to contribute uh, uh, in terms of an experience or, or some, you know, final thoughts, parting thoughts? Just, just for me, uh, Hans, in, in, in my final thoughts in, in closing, I think everybody's remarks have, have just been outstanding and right on point. Um, but when we go back to what is the motivator behind some of um, the get rid of school base is it's many people have taken the program and I think Martha hit it on the head and made it compete with community or made it compete with other funding um, other programs and I don't think this is a competition I think there is enough in our communities um, where we all can join hands and really do some great work what JJCPA allowed us to do was while the school base uh, officer had the kid on campus in the daytime, we had CBOs that went into the home, high risk, high need for those families that needed that piece, that extra additional in-home services. And I think if they just step back and look at this service model that starts and it services kids from school all the way through into the community, uh, everybody really has a place 
to really help family and help kids. And I think that is the message um, that we need to get out. Because no matter how much we tell them, kids don't recidivate, kids are better off and kids come back. I think you've stood in meetings. I've heard Mr. Ford speak uh, on behalf um, when institutions um, were under attack for things that were just, just were not true. I think we really are gonna have to push for a real uh, strategic model that shows that everybody has a place. Uh, we don't need to move out the probation officer to move in somebody else and everybody has a role. Um, and so hopefully we'll get to that, that sort of dialogue. Um, I believe out of the pandemic, great things will come um, and we may be able to come around the table and then have that conversation about what does that look like and, and how do we all come together and put the kid and the family in the center and figure out what does it take to make that kid and that family and that community successful. So um, hopefully um, these uh, conversations like these and, and these great uh, probation officers that are online sharing their hearts and, and they've dedicated their hearts and souls to this department will have opportunity again to um, further this discussion. Um, so we look forward to, to many more of these and thank you for having me. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, Rich, do you have any final comments? No, I'm good. Just uh, thanks for inviting me. I mean, I, I, I'd kind of lost all hope. I kind of talked to Ernesto every once in a while, but that, that this was never going to have a chance of coming back. And so, right, if it's not going to end, I mean, that would just make me so happy. So, uh, you know, thanks for uh, uh, letting me be a part. I had a very interesting story just myself with a probation officer. I had a nonprofit years ago where I was taking kids from the inner city to Israel for like a two month period. And this probation officer, which uh, he came to me and he says, look, I have a kid, you got to take this kid with you. If you don't take this kid with you, he's gonna be dead by the end of the summer because all of these other kids, they want him to get into a gang. He doesn't want to be in a gang. They're beating him to death and they made him steal a car. This is why he's on probation. I took that kid with me. He, and, and he was so different than everybody else in a sense because all the kids that were with us were kids who were going to college and they were talking about college. And he was just thinking about how he was going to survive. And so it's just like Martha was saying also that a lot of times the biggest thing is for the kid to graduate from high school. Everybody is so not only did he graduate from high school, he went to college for a, a period of time. And to this day, he's with his kid <laughs> and he's doing well. So I know that probation officers have so many stories. And we're losing you a little bit, Cookie, on that. Uh, at the end, you cut off a little, but I think we got the gist of it. You know, I think that we, we've all had our moments uh, working in the department where we get that satisfied feeling once we know that we've done something to help that kid or to help that family. And I think, you know, I think on the discussion today, it's very clear where our hearts are uh, regarding the youth that we, we work with. And uh, you know, hopefully we can get this message out and, and really articulate who we are as probation officers. So um, if there are no other comments, I wanna thank you all uh, for taking the time. I think we're going to continue doing this as, uh, as the uh, days, you know, as the year progresses on specific issues. And uh, we would love to be able to reach out to you uh, in the future uh, to get your input as well on, on certain areas of expertise. So if there are no uh, other comments, um, thank you again. And uh, hopefully this is a, a good beginning to getting our message out uh, to everyone. So thank you. And if there's nothing else, have a great evening. <laughs>